Who invented basketball's jump shot? There are several early players considered to have invented the jump shot, but this video is about Joe Folks. One of the NBA's first ever ball gods was born in Birmingham, Kentucky. He went to school there until it was underwater. Not because of his jumper, but because the Tennessee Valley Authority built a dam, flooding several towns, including his. So the family moved to Catawba in 1938. Folks grew up playing basketball on a hoop outside his school. John Criscow wrote a book called The Origins of the Jump Shot, describing Folks as a kid watching local hooper Robert Goheen score the ball with a two-handed leaping shot. Folks watched in awe as Goheen shot the complex version of what Folks would eventually turn into his jump shot. He'd go on to try anything shooting the ball, day and night for hours on end, and with help from Goheen, he'd perfect his jump shot. Part of what made Folk's game so deadly is the improvisation. Back then, this style of play was unheard of. Nobody was doing this. You were coached to keep both feet on the ground and to shoot a balanced, two-handed shot. But not Folk's. Joe Folks went to Katawa High School, leading the Lions to a second region championship and a state tournament berth in 1940 before losing to Morgan Field by two in the first round. Folks was on the Kentucky All-Star team his senior year in 1940. The Kentucky High School All-Stars would play Indiana's High School All-Stars, where Folks would score 18 of Kentucky's 29 points, but would lose the game to Henry Piercy and Indiana's All-Stars. Joe was just getting started with his game, earning a full basketball scholarship to the Murray State Teachers College, where he dropped buckets on the freshman team, scoring just over 16 a game, which at the time was unheard of. The first ever turnaround jump shooter had arrived. Just picture Kobe and Larry Bird without the passing, but we'll talk about that later. The way folks could shoot with either hand, sometimes switching hands midair to throw off defenders. He was playing 2000s basketball in the 40s, an undeniable early god of basketball. Now as a sophomore, folks could play on the varsity team at Murray State, scoring just over 13 a game he'd lead the team to a national intercollegiate basketball tournament berth, where the Thoroughbreds would lose in the championship game to San Diego State. In 1942, he'd lead the team to another tournament berth, but would lose by four in overtime to East Central State. His last chance at a collegiate title game would come in 1943, as Folks again would lead his Thoroughbreds to the NAIA tournament. They'd win their first game, making it to the second round against Kansas's Southwestern. At first, things were going all right. Up 10 at halftime, the team just had to keep doing what worked. Let the shooter shoot. In the second half, Southwestern would close the gap, making it anyone's game. And nine lead changes later, the score was tied at 40, with four minutes to go. Folks scored a clutch free throw, and along with his teammate Padgett grabbing a bucket, they were now up four. And in the final seconds of the game, Southwestern scored, but it wasn't enough, keeping Murray State's title hopes alive. Joe would help his team to one more win in the tournament before losing to Southeast Missouri State. They would then play a tough third place game against North Texas State and after overtime would lose by four, ending the college career of a Murray State legend who had taken the team to a 39-9 record, which to this day is one of the best runs in a long and storied history of Murray State basketball. Joe Folks would be named an NAIA All-American before he was drafted to the Marines. World War II was just heating up, and he'd see action in Guam and Iwo Jima. 
though he'd still play ball for the Fleet Marine Force team at Pearl Harbor. And one day, Philadelphia spa player Petey Rosenberg witnessed Folk's shooting ability and was so impressed, he persuaded the man running the Philadelphia team, Eddie Gottlieb, to sign him. In 1946, the same year the Basketball Association of America would be created, 25-year-old Folks returned home from the Marines and signed with the Philadelphia Warriors for $8,000 a year. It would soon be Folks League, as he scored 25 points in the first game of his career, which at the time was ludicrous. The New York Knicks president recognized him as the best player in the country, and Folks would prove it, scoring 23.2 points per game his rookie season. The second best scorer in the league that year was Bob Fierick, who was 6 points per game behind Joe. In the inaugural year of the BAA, they played a 60-game season. There were 11 teams in the league, and Folks would take his Warriors to second place in the Eastern Division, behind the Washington Capitals, who were 14 games ahead of Philly. Six teams made it to the playoffs, but the format was much different than today. The Eastern first place Washington Capitals would play the Western first place, Chicago Stags, in a seven game series. The winner of that series would make it to the title game. Because Folk's Philly team made second place in the East, they played the West's second place, St. Louis Bombers, and with a win, make it to the conference championships. In the best of three series against St. Louis, Folk's would go 16 for 71. 22% shooting from the field. But with 16 points a game, he led his Warriors to a series win 2-1 over St. Louis. His team would now play the New York Knicks for a chance to get to the BAA's first ever championship game. In this series, Jumpin' Joe didn't give no folks, sweeping New York 2-0 and dropping 20 a game. He'd now have a chance to win his first ever NBA championship against the East's first place Chicago Stags. Chicago won their series against the first place Capitals, four games to two. But Joe didn't give no folks, scoring 37 in the first game, 21 of those coming in the fourth quarter, where he only missed one shot, finishing the series with an incredible for the time 26 points a game, winning his and the NBA's first championship series, four to one. Joe shot 74% from the free throw line, but field goal percentage wasn't tracked in the series. The reason I bring up folks' field goal percentage, like Kobe, Joe was not about passing the ball. You may call him the league's first ever black hole. He shot 30% from the field in the 46-47 championship season, in a league where players shot the ball at 27.9%. And in the very next year, he'd shoot a career low 25%, which was a little lower than the league average. Back then, basketball was much more team-focused than it is today, and for an individual to be taking that many shots, well, it got people talking. The league didn't like his style of play. It didn't matter though, really, because Philadelphia head coach Eddie Gottlieb made a game plan around Folks, giving him almost all of the Warrior shots. It was an attempt to compete with other rival sports leagues, like the football and hockey leagues of the time. The BAA needed a star, and Gottlieb made sure to pad as many stats as possible. Because of this, the BAA stayed alive long enough to bridge the gap between a league of just a few superstars to several a few years later. That being said, Joe's style of play led to some outrageous shooting percentages. One in particular where Folks missed 42 shots in a single game, which to this day is a record. He had 35 points in that game, but he was 13 for 55 shooting, 22% from the field. This was enough to win the game though, 88 to 57. I gotta shout out Curtis Harris's Substack. What I'm about to show you came from his article on Joe Folks. There's a link in the description. It's from 1947, the Boston Globe. The article calls him a slow, individualist point hog. Folks played iso ball and was not about passing. He led the league in scoring by 300 points. Celtics coach Honey Russell said he takes more shots than anybody else because he's a great shot. Nobody could score as Folks does without shooting all the time. Still, I wish I had him. I'd build the Celtics around him. Maybe the first evidence that a player could dominate without passing the basketball? Because in the 47-48 season, 
Folks would again take his team to the title game, this time a one seed with a record of 27 and 21. But the league was quickly catching on to Folks' shooting ability as players got better year after year and the game started to evolve. The Warriors would drop the title series in 1948 to the Baltimore Bullets, 4 to 2. The league was catching up to his shot, but Joe still didn't give no fucks, dropping a career high 63 points and of course no assists, cause why pass it when you can hit a turnaround jumper in everybody's face? By the 52-53 season, he'd shoot his career best 34% from the field. But the league had grown up by then, and his Warriors would finish last in the Eastern Division. Well, the whole league, really, at 12-57. and 57. Folks gave it one more year of pro basketball in the 53-54 season, but by then he was getting old, and the skill level in the league had gone up exponentially since his rookie season in 46. He'd scored 2.4 points per game and decide to retire. Now what an incredible career for one of the first ever ball gods. Not necessarily the inventor of the jump shot, but the first to use a turnaround jump shot to dominate defenses. That brings me to the last part of his life, which is difficult because of how tragic it is. I don't really care all that much about basketball players' personal lives. I just have an appreciation for their game. But what I'm about to tell you is unfortunately relevant to his legacy. In the book Origins of the Jump Shot, Chris Gow says folks told Philly reporters liquor had always been in his life, going back to childhood. He was a country boy and didn't like the city life so he used his spare time to drink. Head coach Eddie Gottlieb would keep him from going out before games, so Joe hid a case of beer in the closet and would have a few before games. Life was a little rocky for folks after retirement, as he struggled to hold jobs down, and finally he landed a job at the Kentucky State Penitentiary as an athletic director. One March night after work, he went to visit his girlfriend Roberta at her home in Beckett's trailer court. Roberta's son, Greg, was there, who didn't like Joe, wishing his mother was with his father. It was an ordinary night. Greg was drinking with Joe and helping him fix his car, and it got late. An argument started about who owned a thirty-eight pistol, which had belonged to Greg's wife, Sharon, who was also there that night. Joe carried the pistol back to his bedroom, and Greg carried his shotgun from the trunk of his car. He confronted Joe in the bedroom, demanding him leave the house. Greg shot Joe Folks in the neck. The legendary basketball player and inventor of the turnaround jumper was dead at 54 years old. In 1978, two years after his death, he was inducted into the Naismith Memorial Hall of Fame 